is to use a snap throttle test. And what that means is um, taking the, the throttle and wide open throttle all the way for just a second and then let it go. And that is going to give a very characteristic pattern that they're showing here that indicates that the air fuel sensor is working because doing that snap throttle is going to test the sensor in both directions, lean and rich. So what that's going to look like is you, of course, will be at your perfect stoichiometry. And then when you snap the throttle here and you go to wide open throttle, you're going to see a sharp decrease in the voltage. And then almost immediately when you let go, you're going to, of course, create an extremely lean condition. So you're going to get an increase in voltage and then it's fairly quickly going to stable back out. So this is the pattern that you could use without even getting your fingers dirty or anything. We are, of course, going to do all of these tests with the propane, the intake leak, and the snap throttle. I can tell you that I have done this test on a Toyota before, and it looked exactly like this, absolutely exactly like this. So if you have a Toyota, that's great. I can tell you I also did this on a Ford that used a wide band sensor, and it kind of really didn't look very much like that. And I'm not really sure what's going to happen on the Subaru. But um, I, one thing I do know that's going to be different is these voltage numbers will be different. That's, that's almost guaranteed. But this pattern may not look exactly the same. So I'm going to um, do all the methods, and we'll just see what happens. And uh, while I'm cleaning up here, I should point out that, uh, again, um, because of the extreme temperature that O2 sen um, that wideband sensors work at, they typically, like late model cars with O2 sensors, there are heater circuits. So the other thing that often goes wrong with a sensor isn't so much the sensing, but the heater circuit can give different trouble codes, uh, different check engine lights. So those are identical. Um, just like with a regular oxygen sensor, you would look for continuity on the heater circuit in the sensor itself, and you would do the same thing with a wideband sensor. So some things uh, really don't change. The other thing that doesn't change is your understanding of fuel trim. Fuel trim, whether it's derived from oxygen sensor data or wideband O2 sensor data, fuel trims don't change. Thank goodness. Another, you know, something we don't have to adapt to. But if you understand fuel trims and you use them in diagnoses like you should, then that doesn't change. Just the source of the information changes a little. So let's talk about one other thing that can be very useful in your diagnosis of a wideband oxygen sensor to determine if it's faulty or not. Okay. So when you look at your um, air fuel sensor um, on a scan tool and you pull up your PIDs for it and it could say wideband oxygen sensor. It'll probably say something like bank one S1 wideband O2 something like that or bank one S1 um, AF something or other. Some, some scan tools even say lambda sensor whatever but whatever the case is you're going to have several different PIDs and one of them is going to be sort of a what the hell is that PID. Obviously one of the first PIDs you're going to generally use is the voltage. You also um, may be able to have a milliamp PID, and some scan tools may not even be able to really read that or even show that as an option. But you're also going to get another PID showing up on your scan tool that actually I find to be pretty useful. And that's going to be your equivalence ratio PID. What in the hell is that. So what the equivalence ratio is, is it's a really great diagnostic tool that you can use because as we've seen, many different cars can use many different standards for their voltage outputs. So let's say you have a Toyota here and we know that's going to be 3.3 volts. Um, the Subaru was somewhere around like 2.25 or 2.5 volts, something like that. Um, Ford was somewhere around, I don't know, we'll just say three volts. Okay. The thing is, these are all normal stoichiometric readings for those particular cars and maybe even that in that particular model year as a matter of fact. Well the problem is you don't know that. So unless you can find what that information would be, you can easily see where if you've worked on Toyotas your whole life and you get used to this as being stoichiometric and then you work on a Subaru and you see that this Subaru is stuck at 2.5 volts, you might be inclined to say, "Oh, 
This is the reason why there is a rich code in this car because this wideband O2 sensor is stuck rich. Well, no, it's not. It's at stoichiometry. It just uses a different voltage. That's all. All three of these are in stoichiometry. But what an equivalence ratio does is the equivalence ratio, we'll just call it an ER, sets stoichiometric at one, regardless of the voltage system. So this kind of normalizes for you, regardless of the system you're looking at, to be able to determine if the car is indeed at stoichiometry at this voltage. So if you look at, say, this Ford, which is at three volts, and you're not sure if this flat line at three volts is stoichiometric, you can pull up the equivalence ratio on your scan tool, and if that equivalence ratio is one, then you know that this is the normal voltage reading, imaginary reading, for that Ford. And if your variance from the equivalence ratio is greater than one, then that is going to indicate a lean condition. And if your equivalence ratio is less than one, that is going to indicate a rich condition. So you can get by using the equivalence ratio with or even without the voltage and be able to determine if you're getting responses lean or rich with the car. So I think what we're going to do now is go ahead and take all of this information because all of this information is assuming that I'm understanding it correctly and we are going to test it by going ahead to uh, warm up the Subaru and see how this stuff actually looks when we apply it real time onto a car. So let's go see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and set up my scan tool while the engine warms up. And uh, during this time, I wanna point out just for the record that I hate Subarus. I hate them. I hate their 180 degree cylinder heads. I hate them. But uh, it's the only car that I have available right now that I know has air fuel sensors. So let me go ahead and get this set up and then we'll see how close the data uh, and information that we went over actually applies in a real scenario. All right, and I know people are gonna be asking, what is the scan tool I'm using? This is going to be uh, Auto Ingenuity. Um, I talk a little bit about this in one of my other videos where I compare a couple of scan tools that I like to use, both of them PC-based. So if you're interested uh, in buying a scan tool, especially after this video, then you can click on my name, uh, Schrodinger's Box, and it'll bring up my pit channel. And then from the channel, you can find my video for the scan tools, but also maybe I'll put it in the description below. But let's go ahead and um, pull up our wideband oxygen sensor voltage. Right. There it is. So again, this is a four cylinder. So um, which the, the fact that I drive a four cylinder car is embarrassing enough, much less a Subaru, to be honest. But um, as with oxygen sensors, you would have one wideband O2 per bank. Same thing as an oxygen sensor. But uh, we're going to go ahead and do the voltage. Now, when I do that, we can see our voltage scale here. And we see that we're actually at two and a quarter volts almost. We see the actual numerical number given there. Um, so this is actually lower than what you would get with my examples that I gave with the Toyota. But as I said, this voltage is going to be different for different cars, different years, different makes, different models. Um, the question is, is this a good number? Well, I don't know. Um, so that's one of the things we're gonna wanna do is find out. Um, maybe it should be 3.3 volts like a Toyota and this number is not actually at stoichiometry. Well, what's a good way to know? Let's do this. Let's go ahead and look at that equivalence ratio because if this engine is in stoichiometry right now, and this is the actual voltage for stoichiometry on this particular car, that equivalence ratio that I mentioned before should be one. So let's go ahead and pull up equivalence ratio. And there it is right there, the wideband equivalence ratio. And there it is. And we can see here on our scale for equivalence ratio that we are indeed at one. So good indication that we are either running at stoichiometry or 
the O2, the wideband O2 sensor is stuck in stoichiometry, which is unlikely. This is really a fairly new car. But we can see that, as um, I had stated, um, this is according to plan. So let's, uh, let me do a couple of adjustments here. One of the most important things you want to remember is that with your sensor on a wideband, you're going to get less of a amplitude of reaction than you will with an oxygen sensor. So I just want to quickly adjust uh, a couple of the uh, scales here so that I can maximize any difference that we expect to see. Okay, so um, I've sort of adjusted the scale to amplify um, anything because I expect there to be fairly minimal changes here. Remember, these voltages are not real, and we'll look at that in a little bit. The first test that I want to do is let's go ahead and do that test that we saw with the Toyota sensor that I described, where if I do a wide open throttle, we should get an immediate dip, and then an immediate rise, and then a stabling out. And remember, we should actually see that on both of these traces, I believe, but really what we're looking at is the voltage, the red trace. So I'll have to get into the car to do this, so let's try it. Oh, well, I'll be darned, look at that. It actually did seem to reproduce that trace. Uh, I haven't seen that all cars tend to do that. And then it stabilized out again. Let's try that one more time. All right, I'll be darned. Now, it doesn't look nearly to me like the trace shown for the um, Toyota. Let me go ahead and bring that up real quick just to show you. Okay, so this is the Toyota document uh, from the engineers at Toyota. And what I'm looking at is the amplitude for the rich condition and lean condition seem to be equivalent here. Um, in other words, there is just as much of a dip as there is a rise here, and then it levels out. However, we don't seem to see that on this car. There is definitely a dip and a rise, but watch the amplitudes, they're different, I think. So we can see the dip is not nearly as much as the rise um, compared to the Toyota, but it's still fairly similar, so I'm pretty satisfied. The bottom line is, this is clearly a functioning air fuel sensor. So if you had a lean code or a rich code that says something blah, 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 air fuel sensor, blah, blah, like most people would interpret, you would know, based on that test, almost certainly not to replace the air fuel sensor. So let's go ahead and try a couple other things. One of the things that I want to do, let's go ahead and pull a vacuum hose and see what the response from the computer is. Now, before I do this, remember, what is the reaction that we are expecting to see? Remember, it's going to be backwards. On an O2 sensor, we would expect to see these numbers go lean by showing lower voltage. But if my understanding is correct on this, what we're going to expect to see when I make this lean condition by pulling the hose, we're going to see the voltage and also the equivalence increase. Okay, so let's see if that actually happens. All right, maybe you can hear the vacuum leak. I almost killed the engine there, but unquestionably, it did increase. So that test worked pretty good. Uh, let me go grab a can of propane and let's see if we can do the opposite. All right, I'm gonna add some propane uh, just directly into the air box here, just briefly. And let's see if we get, and you see it does indeed go rich, which does look a little bit backwards. And of course the fuel trim is correcting because I'm really not adding that much into here yet. Let's add a little more. And we see it does indeed have the predicted response. So that's all really cool. 
that actually turned out to be quite satisfying. Um, there is one other thing that I want to do though, and this is uh, really a lot more for my personal interest. One of my favorite tests that I like to do is to look at a wide open throttle test while driving. It's one of the few times that I actual, actually literally use the oxygen sensor data in a diagnosis. Normally, again, like I say, you're like a detective and the oxygen or wideband sensor is your witness. So it's reporting a situation and your first thing is, is my witness lying or are they telling the truth? And once you determine the witness is lying, well, then you're done. You need a new witness. You need a new oxygen sensor or air fuel sensor because your witness is faulty. However, if, the, if you find that your witness is reliable, well then, you don't sit there and investigate the witness. You look at the things the witness is telling you and you follow those things to get your diagnosis. So you really don't so much use the witness itself for your diagnosis. You don't really look at a O2 sensor trace and use that as a diagnosis. You just look at this trace to help determine that it's functioning. However, there is an exception that I use on that, and that is when I am diagnosing a lean condition and I want to see if the lean condition is related to the mass airflow sensor or the fuel pump. In other words, a lean condition that is um, because of a dirty math or poor delivery from the fuel pump. And what that pattern is going to look like is, again, you're going to be, because of your fuel trim, in stoichiometry, but then when you floor the pedal, which on this Subaru is going to be less than satisfying because I don't know how people with four cylinders do this, but um, I don't expect it's going to go very fast, but it is going to do something universal, I hope, and that is it's going to go rich at wide open throttle. And I know this from racing my Trans Am at the racetrack uh, while connected to my scan tool. I can tell you that when you floor a car, it's going to go rich at wide open throttle. And this is actually a hugely important diagnosis because if you floor that pedal and at wide open throttle, you see your O2 sensor go lean, this is the only time that I really use the actual data from the O2 in a diagnosis. I am going to call at wide open throttle, if I see that, a bad mass airflow sensor or a bad fuel pump. Some type of delivery problem of the fuel is an issue. And that is something that I do not want to lose the capability of doing because of an air fuel sensor. So what would we expect? Um, let's, let's do this on the Subaru. So we know now that our uh, stoichiometry is at about 2.2 volts now. And uh, let's put 3.5 up here and let's put uh, 1.5 here. So if we're at stoichiometry in our Subaru and I floor it, what would the expected response be? Well, it's going to be that it should go rich, which means that we should see a decline in voltage and again, that's that funky interpreted voltage. But I really want to see that because this is one of the most important diagnoses that I typically do in diagnosing lean conditions. And I have other videos that show this. I don't want to lose that capability on an air fuel sensor because it's very important. So what I want to do is go drive the car, floor it, and see if I get this response. Now, I'm not going to bring you along with me. You have to wait in the classroom because of safety and I don't want to film this and everything, but I'm going to do a screen capture and we'll see what happens when I floor the car. All right, I am back from my uneventful test drive, although I do have some good data here, but I just wanted to say as much as I hate that Subaru, it reminds me of how much more I hate four-cylinder engines. For the life of me, I do not understand how they calculate the zero to 60 time on a four cylinder engine because by the time that car gets up to 60, I'm already where I need to be. Let me orient you here. Um, we can actually ignore the uh, red and green lines. I was just doing some fuel trim experiments there to show that uh, fuel trim is the same thing whether you have a wide band or a narrow band oxygen sensor. So um, ignore those. But what we're looking at here is the blue line. And the blue line is the sensor voltage for the wide band sensor. And we can see um, the scale is actually shown over here. Um, so we can see that we're at our 2.2 volts at idle and we're still at idle. And then right here, 
I floor the car. And I kind of, in retrospect now, wish that I had adjusted the scale like I did earlier to be able to detect this a little better. But there is indeed a rich um, condition here uh, that is shown by the air fuel sensor at wide open throttle, which is uh, as we would expect. Um, although it's not nearly as prominent as what I would expect. And we can also see that actually it increases ever so slowly in richness as I continue to hold down on the throttle. And uh, luckily in a four cylinder car, car, you can hold the throttle down for a very long time because it doesn't go faster when you do it, but it sure sounds like it does. Um, and then here I go ahead and I just let go of the throttle, which of course, greatly creates a lean condition, which is very prominently reported by the sensor. And then it pretty quickly levels out again. But while I'm happy to see that I can detect the rich condition at wide open throttle here, um, it's not very prominent. And again, I don't know whether this is simply because that's the way it's reported on this car. Um, Subarus are very well known for their fuel efficiency, especially these later models. Maybe this is just some type of fuel efficiency um, kind of thing that's going on here. But the bottom line is that I'm very happy to see that I can detect a rich signal from the air fuel sensor at wide open throttle. The point of it is, had I been diagnosing a lean condition, and I had seen the opposite where I get a little bit of a lean condition at wide open throttle, it does give me direction on where to go to help solve that lean condition. So this is very satisfying. All right, well, that's it for my training. At this point, I've achieved my objectives. I uh, feel like I do have a very good understanding of the air fuel sensors because I was able to validate what I understand and predict what would happen given various conditions on an actual car. I feel like I'm pretty confident I would be able to diagnose a faulty air fuel sensor. And I also feel like I can use air fuel sensors to assist me in my diagnoses. So today was a really good day and I really hope that it was for you too and that you learned something. So thanks for joining me in class today. We'll certainly do it again sometime. And I wanted to say real quick, thanks to you guys. Um, while it's not a very big thing, I did actually reach 1000 subscribers on my last video last month. So um, I really appreciate it. And I do appreciate you guys taking the time to watch my my videos and all the feedback that I get, even the negative. So I appreciate it very much. I hope you found this helpful. We'll see you next time.